I call this remote meeting of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee to order. Today is April 21st, 2020. This meeting is being held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which passed and allows for remote hearing. All remote hearings are recorded and in live stream by House Public Information. I am State Representative Rick Hansen, and I have the privilege of chairing the House Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee, this biennium. Members, just a few reminders on guidelines. As with any committee hearing, all committee discussions will continue to go through the chair. If you want to be recognized, please use the raise your hand button on your participants panel. And we do have members on the phone. For members on the phone, please use star nine and that should activate a raise your hand symbol. If you are not getting called on, please send an email to the committee administrator, Peter Strohmeyer from your house account. Please mute yourselves so we can reduce any background noise and maintain the quality of the presentation. All voting will be done by roll call taken by the committee legislative assistants. I should note that the minutes uh, do not have to be done by roll call. Please try to limit the noise in your workspace during roll calls. Members are expected to unmute themselves when voting and when called on by the chair. The CA and the CLA may mute members if their mute is left off and there is background noise. Are there any questions from members? Seeing none, the clerk will take the attendance by roll. Representative Hanson. Present. Representative Claflin. Here. Representative Fabian. Here. Representative Backer. Here. Representative Becker Finn. Present. Go ahead. Representative Eklund. Representative Eklund. Present. Representative Fisher. Present. Representative Green. Here. <laughs> Representative Heintzman. Here. Representative Lee. Present. Representative Lewick. Here. Representative Morrison. Present. Representative Nelson. Here. Representative Purcell. Representative Purcell. Present. Representative Sandell. Present. Representative Sundin. Representative Sundin. Present. Present. Representative Tice. Present. Representative Wadinius. Here. 18 members present. A quorum is present. The next item on the agenda are the minutes for Thursday, March 12th. Representative Becker Finn, would you like to move the minutes? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I would move those minutes with one amendment. Uh, I noticed that the spelling of uh, Kirk Kadelka's name from the MPCA needs to be corrected, so I would move the minutes with that change. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor, this is where we can uh, say aye rather than doing a roll call. So if you could uh, note aye. 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 Are there any nays? 
The ayes have it and the minutes are adopted. Thank you. The next item, I will move the House file 4498 be recommended to be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Members, this is the LCCMR bill. This includes projects tentatively selected by the Legislative and Citizen Commission on Minnesota Resources. Uh, it does not include grants for wastewater treatment. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nash and the entire LCCMR members and staff for your work. Ms. Nash is here to answer any questions. I would also like to note that we have Mr. Meyer from the DNR, Ms. Gothier from the MPCA, and Ms. Becker Kadelka from Bowser, the Board of Water and Soil Resources, available for questions. Also on the call is Ms. Casey Nowicki, who will be able to answer any questions on the A4 amendment, which will be up later. Members, uh, the bill has been out there. Um, it has the recommendations and or the selections and the topics. A little bit on difference between selections and recommendations. It takes 12 votes of the 17-member Legislative and Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources to make a formal recommendation to the legislature. The package that was voted on received 10 votes, not 12 votes. Uh, the bill that is in front of you is the selected topics without the 1.5 for wastewater treatment. In addition, uh, there is no, uh, there was a project for a Melrose Dam, which was canceled, which was $2.7 million. Are there any questions on the bill? Seeing no hands, I would move to Representative Heinzman. I believe you have the A2 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have the uh, A2 amendment. Um, amendment is pretty straightforward. Um, the chair just mentioned that there is one project that was not included in the package of projects that's before us today as uh, it had majority support but uh, the full package of uh, projects is not before us today. Mm -hmm. um, the chair is correct that it takes a um, it takes a full 12 votes to move the LCCMR's recommendations forward to the legislature, and those votes were not present. So this particular uh, uh, amendment is bringing back the wastewater treatment grants. And uh, I, would, uh, I would appreciate support for this as it was a part of that package as, a re as recommended by a majority vote, uh, just like the rest of the provisions that are currently in the bill. Heinzman moves the A4 amendment. Is there any discussion on the A4 amendment? Representative Fabian. Representative Fabian, did you have, I saw a blue hand there for a, a moment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would uh, speak in favor of the A4 amendment. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm wondering if uh, Ms. Nash uh, could weigh in um, I know we've had discussion of this issue in the past and just wondering about the potential con constitutionality uh, of this specific provision. Uh, X18, 125 CC, Ms. Nash. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, um, this question has been um, discussed, discussed quite a bit at the LCCMR level and the um, particular constitutionality of it. The Constitution does allow for loans to be made against the corpus of the fund for purposes of water infrastructure. Um, and the statute 116P that guides 
Um, the LCCMAR does also include some language that restricts the use of funds for water infrastructure. Um, two years ago, the statute was changed to allow for um, funds to be used for water infrastructure in towns under a population of 5,000. Um, there has continued to be conversation and concern among some LCCMAR members, however, that um, that does not address the language in the Constitution, which some suggest um, may have been an intent at the time that the Constitution was passed that the funds would not be allowed for grants and only for loans. But there is disagreement. Um, I'm not a lawyer, um, so I can't tell you what the final decision is. I can just tell you that there has been quite a bit of conversation and concern among the members, um, you know, expressing interest on both sides of the issue. Representative Sandell, and then Representative Wagenius, and then Representative Tice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think there's a little bit of confusion. I thought that Representative Heinsons was talking about Amendment A2, but subsequently there's been reference to uh, uh, Amendment A4. Um, is it A2 we're talking about or A4? It is the A2 amendment, my error. Thank you. Representative Wagenius. I have to unmute here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to clarify for members that when the Constitution was originally voted on, where the language was originally voted on, and in subsequent uh, votes to affirm the language, uh, there was already a statute on the books that Representative Wagenius, you're caught in kind of mid- On the constitutional amendment. So those citizens uh, who voted for it knew or should have known, and that was certainly talked about a lot, um, that this money could be used for loans. That is, the corpus could be used for loans, but the grants could not be used, I mean, the money could not be used for grants for wastewater treatment. And one of the reasons, this is very practical, uh, that that language was put in is because the uh, money available is small compared to the need for um, wastewater treatment. So the way we fund wastewater treatment is with bonding. And the governor has been very generous in allocating or recommending uh, I think that is the traditional way to fund it and I support all those uh, bonds that the governor's talking about, uh, but not this amendment. Representative Tice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This morning, I was on a community call, and what I'm hearing again from my cities, which actually are above, well, two of the three are above uh, 5,000, but yet what I'm hearing from them is their revenue is down so drastically, they're not really sure how they're going to keep going or how they're going to start up again once they are. One of the things that uh, one of the mayors brought up was the fact that for St. Cloud, um, there is such a... Uh, Oh, what do I want to say? A decrease in water usage and that the hospital isn't using the same amount of water. A lot of the bigger businesses are not using the same amount of water. So I look at this as um, I'm not sure how some of the smaller cities are going to start up again once they get going and then have to take care of some of their water treatment issues. I really think this is a good deal, especially in this time. And I would think that we would be wanting to help them out as much as possible since we are really concerned about water. Um, it was really, uh, I guess, uh, what eye-opening to me to hear the mayors talk about how, because the water usage is down, it's gonna be harder for them to get back up on their feet later because of the lack of revenue coming in right now. Uh, I'm sure a lot of families are gonna see their water usage go up because they're not used to having 
everybody home at, at one time, uh, all day, every day. But I really think this is something we need to take seriously because I think there's going to be a huge need, especially in rural Minnesota, because of the 5,000 um, uh, cap. They're going to have a hard time going forward. They're going to have a hard time getting up and going. They're going to have issues. And I think anything we can do to help them, I think this is a major part. This is what we should be doing anyway. But especially in these times, I think this is a part that we really need to look at and help these smaller communities get back up and running and being able to take care of their wastewater treatment or uh, wastewater uh, or water plants. I'm, I'm fully supportive of this and I wanna thank Representative Heinzman for bringing it forward. Is there any other discussion? Members, I would ask uh, to vote against the A2 amendment. Uh, the rationale, I wanna give a little bit of history uh, for the process. So the Legislative and Citizens Commission on Minnesota Resources sends out a request for proposals. Those proposals come forward and they're vetted through a process where hearings are held. And I should note, we are trying to find a way of doing digital hearings for uh, this year's proposal. Um, what happened, how the wastewater treatment, which you may remember last year, was a subject of great controversy in the legislative session and the final LCCMR bill to have loans for wastewater treatment. Um, the 1.5 that was in the bill that was, or that was selected at the last LCCMR meeting where we voted on these but did not make the recommendation status was um, not a proposal. The Public Facilities Authority did not put forth a proposal it was not named for a specific location. It was just $1.5 million in grants. As Representative Wagenius noted back when the Lottery uh, Environmental Trust Fund dedication was noted, um, the concern about wastewater treatment consuming the entire fund because the demand is high was clearly stated. The reason as the chief author on this bill, I did not put the wastewater treatment in is because of those constitutional concerns, the documented history for that, and again, uh, the importance of making sure that there are actual projects. Um, with Representative Heinzman's amendment, uh, it would uh, be taking one or be spending 1.5 million on wastewater treatment. That would have to come from somewhere. Um, there's a variety of projects that are in there. And so I would ask for a no vote on the Heinzman Amendment. I want to make it clear, we know that wastewater treatment is important. Uh, as Representative Wagenius noted, noted, the governor has a large proposal uh, in his draft bonding bill. In addition, I believe there will be a large component for wastewater treatment in uh, a federal uh, COVID response at some point in time. Are there any other questions? Clay, are you ready to take the roll? Representative Heinzman, do you want to say final comments? Yeah, I certainly would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate your comments. Uh, I do obviously differ in my opinion, and I believe that the Constitution backs up my position that these grants absolutely can be made constitutionally. And uh, if folks will rewind the clock back, uh, this issue uh, came up when in uh, a previous bill, we did have the money that you just mentioned available for wastewater treatment grants. And uh, it was signed uh, into law by Governor Dayton and the environmentalist community got very upset. And the reason for that is there's a lot of money here available at the LCCMR and it goes to many, many good projects. This is also a very good project. Uh, we're talking about facility upgrades for those small communities, which in many cases discharge wastewater directly into the Mississippi and other streams, rivers, excuse me, around the state of Minnesota. Um, if you are ever going to clean water, which is part of the uh, responsibility of the LCCMR, this is a phenomenal way to do it. 
If you talk to Minnesotans around the entire state, one of the number one concerns they have is clean water. If there was, like I said, ever an opportunity to clean water, it's at wastewater treatment facilities, and these upgrades are much needed around the entire state. The proposal from two years ago did not go forward after environmentalists threatened to sue. And from my perspective, I wish that it would have gone to the courts and that it would have been settled one way or the other. I would argue, and I've heard others who are legally minded argue that if this would have been ruled unconstitutional, trunk highway fund uh, money would also potentially come into question. That funding mechanism is very similar to what we do here at the LCCMR. The wastewater treatment facility grants, um, the money didn't just take away from other grants as I think is being suggested. It was made a part of the bill that would have ultimately had an opportunity to go forward if it, couldn't, if it didn't get the 12 votes. It had a bipartisan support coming out of the committee uh, at, at that time. And I think that adding it back makes a heck of a lot of sense. And I think that it's at a time when it's of great need across the entire state. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to bring the amendment. The clerk will take the roll. Hanson. No. Claflin. No. Backer, uh, Fabian. Yes. Backer. Backer. Becker Finn. No. Eklund. No. Fisher. No. Green. Yes. Heinzman. Yes. Lee. No. Lewick. Yes. Morrison. No. Nelson. Yes. Purcell. No. Sandell. No. Sundin. No. Tice. Yes. Wagenius. No. Backer. Um, yes. Did you hear me that time? Yep, I got you. Thank you. Seven eyes, 11 nays. The amendment does not prevail. Members, I have an author's amendment that I will move the A3 amendment to get the bill in the shape I would like it. The A3 does the following. I put my glasses on. It provides uh, from the FY 2020 cancellation of the Sock uh, Center project, 900,000 for lawns to legumes. That was Representative Morrison's bill. 699,000 for a U of M project to evaluate the ability of COVID-19 and other potentially infectious organisms to travel through wastewater systems including septic systems to drinking water sources. Uh, this is a new uh, proposal that is coming forward. Uh, you may have read uh, some of the reports about this potential uh, issue relating to COVID-19. An additional 249,000 to fully fund the Science Museum study to determine how, when, and where lakes and pristine areas of the state without obvious nutrient loading are experiencing algal bloom. Blue. This is the full $849,000. And then an additional $320,000 to the DNR for emerald ash borer efforts. For FY 2021, $133,000 to 
for the University of Minnesota Raptor Center to protect raptors from lead poisoning. This is Representative Acom's bill. An additional 404,000, this is Representative Sandell's bill for the full funding for the MPCA to help municipal wastewater plants, landfills, and compost facilities protect human health and, and the environment by developing strategies to man, managing PFAS in land applied biosolids. 350,000 for a grant to the city of Babbitt to expand the Birch Lake Recreation Area. This is Representative Eklund's bill. An additional 118,000 for full funding for the climate generation Will Steger legacy for their teach science schools and STEM learning laboratory. And an additional 658,000 for the University of Minnesota Invasive Terrestrial Plants and Pest Center, and then uh, an additional 437,000 for Emerald Ash Borer response. The amendment also includes extensions for those grants which were set to expire on June 30th this, this year. It adds one year uh, to those extensions. Is there any discussion on the bill? Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, looking at the um, amendment and the projects that you're including, could you tell me if uh, these projects are simply increases to uh, provisions that were included by the commission or are any of these projects new? Thank you, Representative Heisman. There are three uh, types of proposals in there. Uh, some are, ex are additions to projects which were included in the selection. Uh, there are projects where there were bills introduced and heard. Uh, so those were included. And then the final one was the COVID-19 and wastewater, which has been an issue that has just come up in the last week. Uh, the University of Minnesota put together a proposal that we'll, we will be hearing on Thursday in the full LCCMR commission uh, to start a response there, but this is a full funding assessment uh, from the University of Minnesota for COVID-19 uh, and wastewater. If that helps. It, it, it does help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I. I'm wondering, do you have a count of how many of those are completely new that were never heard at the commission level, or is that unknown? It's tough to see it here, just trying to keep tracks and keep, excuse me, keep track why, and keep notes while you're, while you're talking. Representative Heinzman, I believe the uh, Raptor Center had been heard previously, uh, was not heard this year. The full funding for the MPCA, that was heard, and you may remember that was cut uh, from the full funding. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has indicated they need the full funding uh, for that to continue. The Birch Lake, I could have Representative Eklund speak to that. Uh, the climate generation, that was an existing uh, grant or existing collection that had been cut through the process the invasive terrestrial plants and pest center and the emerald ash borer, the receive appropriations, and this is adding to them. Um, Representative Morrison's bill, we heard lawns to legumes uh, last year in the, uh, the project approval that was included in the uh, bill that was passed last year. Again, the 699,000 for COVID-19 is new. Uh, the Science Museum to fully fund, that was restoring the cuts that had gone through the process. And I believe that's each one of the projects. Um, I would uh, refer to Ms. Taylor if I've missed something. Um, Mr. Chair, I think you, you handled it well. Representative Heisman. Um, actually, as you were talking, I received a phone call and my phone cut out for about 10 seconds. D did you mention how many projects are specifically new that haven't been heard by the commission? I might have missed it. Was there a count? Um, Representative Heinzman, I believe it would be the COVID-19 
that had not been heard by the commission. And the lawns to legumes was not an RFP, but was included and we heard the uh, proposal or the uh, project plan approval last summer, if you may remember that, and then Representative Morrison had that as a bill introduction. Uh, the lead uh, Raptor Center had gone through the process in previous years and had been cut, uh, and that was not in the current package. So I believe that would be three that were, I don't know, represent Eklund on Birch Lake. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That was heard at the commission and actually uh, received a high enough score. Uh, I don't recall why it wasn't included in the final package, but since there was some money on the bottom line, we, uh, we were able to put it in. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the clarifications. It's a little bit of a sore spot, of course, for me having previously carried the bill, made changes, and of course, there was a lot of criticism about not following the commission's recommendations. So I did want to confirm um, the number of projects that we're changing or adding without having had support at the LCCMR in the final package that was voted on. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Sandell, then Representative Fisher, and then Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, uh, thank you for the uh, inclusion of an additional $400,000 to the uh, study and management of PFA uh, uh, PFAs and PFOs. Um, I think included in the package today that that's available each rec uh, each representative is the uh, letter from uh, Commissioner Bishop describing the uh, study that they want to complete and um, uh, the additional um, money of $400,000 will let them do that. This is a huge issue and not just for us in the, the Southeast Metro, but uh, throughout the state and really throughout the country. The problem of uh, applying um, uh, biosolids to agricultural land and uh, tracing the the uh, route of PFAs and PFOS uh, into our food chain and into our drinking water is uh, really an enormous issue. And um, I hope we can complete this study and, and really make progress on it and um, um, be a signal state for the rest of the nation here in Minnesota. So thank you very much for that. And I, uh, I'd appreciate the uh, support from the other representatives. Thank you. Representative Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I likewise uh, support your proposed amendment, and in particular, I had a group of Girl Scouts in my area, Girl Scout Troop 56087, who've been e emailing me quite a bit, particularly with the uh, uh, program for the Raptor Center uh, to provide for the educational funding to help educate, uh, to help on lead education, help cut back on lead out in the environment. Uh, this Girl Scout troop would probably have been coming down to the Capitol today if we would have been regular set in a regular meeting. Uh, they have been very active up in our area, bringing uh, educational information to people about the harmful effects of lead on the environment, particularly to our wildlife out there. And this same Girl Scout troop has been very passionate. Uh, uh, they were also presenting the same information at the Water Resource Conference that the university puts on each year. And they're doing a presentation on that, uh, uh, what they call a poster pop-up presentation uh, this past fall. So they're very passionate, they're very happy and advocating, and I'm putting their, helping get their voice out there, holding their voice up on this particular amendment. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity and educate and uh, encourage everyone to help support this part of the amendment. Representative Fabian. Representative Fabian. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the information that's on the Environment Committee website does not include any kind of communication from the University of Minnesota that I can see with regards to uh, the $699,000. Am I missing something? Mr. Meyer. Mr. Chair, we did not receive a letter from the U of M. So, Mr. Chair. Ms. Nash. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, I have been working with the project team over the last week and a half to put together a um, proposal both for the emerging issues um, 
request that Representative Hansen mentioned is going before the LCCMR tomorrow, um, as well as a larger request um, for this 699 um, potential appropriation. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we're putting the cart before, I think we're putting the cart before the horse here. Um, I'd like to uh, actually have heard from the University of Minnesota directly myself before appropriating uh, the 699,000. And I also have to uh, express my uh, support for the sentiment from Representative Heinzman. <clears throat> in the past, when uh, this has been uh, attempted, I'll say in the House, it's been rejected largely uh, by many people. And now the shoe is on the other foot. And I just find this kind of troubling. But the main thing for me is the uh, University of Minnesota, not even including a letter in our packet of information to give them $699,000. Thank you. Ms. Nash, can you uh, describe the project? Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, I did not hear that. Ms. Nash, could you describe the proposal? Um, sure, Mr. Chair, members, um, there has been evidence um, to suggest we know that um, viruses can um, withstand treatment have been found in wastewater. Um, the project staff, the project team believe that the um, wastewater that's treated municipal, uh, municipally um, is likely safe and is going to um, kill off that virus. However, there is evidence to suggest that as the virus is shed through our bodies and released through septic and septic fields, um, that virus percolates through the water and has potential to reach groundwater and private water wells. So this is mostly an issue for uh, more rural communities and any communities who are not disinfecting their municipal wastewater. And one example uh, might be the Brainerd-Baxter area. So um, this project would be sampling um, uh, all sorts of um, different um, septic fields and um, determining sort of the length of time that these viruses are traveling. And of course, that's gonna depend on what area of the state you are and what kind of groundwater conditions there are. But um, there is a concern that this is a um, public health threat. And Ms. Nash, could you state the researchers, please, the project proposal? Oh, Mr. Chair and members, um, the researchers are Dr. Tim LaPera and Dr. Raymond Hazalski. Um, these are folks from the Civil and Environmental Engineering Group at the University of Minnesota. Um, rep, I'll get back to you, Representative Fabian. We got Representative Backer, Representative Becker Finn, and then uh, back to Representative Fabian. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I would have to agree with Representative Fabian uh, on this one. Um, it would be nice to get more details on from the U, um, especially with what happened with the prior amendment where we have had a history of supporting clean water. I, we just need to make sure that these funds during this time is used what it's intended for, even though, I mean, on the surface, it sounds reasonable. I would have to agree with that. But, you know, the details are something that we are not um, getting. So I would agree with Representative Fabian on this. Thank you. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just wanted to clarify for folks who are maybe watching and for posterity here, um, I, th I think it's a little ridiculous that we're complaining about not having a letter um, from the U of M while we legislate via Zoom during a pandemic about uh, some money that's going to go to, and I'm gonna, the, the name, the title of the project is Evaluating Coronavirus and other microbiological contamination of drinking water sources from wastewater. So of course this came about quickly. Um, of course this isn't something that was heard in committee previously. Of course this is something new. Um, and, and the money is going to the Board of Regents of the University of Minnesota, um, who we all know the level of research that we get out of the U of M. Um, so I just think it's a little, it is this interesting that, uh, you know, this much discussion and sort of consternation about 
maybe the most important project that's being added in here um, at this time where we're making sure that folks aren't going to be uh, picking up COVID-19 um, you know, through other mechanisms in addition to what we're already worrying about. Uh, so I fully uh, support this amendment and just want to point out it's, uh, it's just surprising to me that there's this much sort of consternation about something that's obviously this important right now. Representative Fabian. Representative Fabian, we can't hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm simply asking a few questions. And, uh, you know, to raise the issue of consternation, I think it's, uh, it, it's, it's disappointing. Um, you know, we're, I'm not uh, the type of person that's just going to take my porridge and go sit in the corner. So um, to uh, Ms. Nash, you said that there was evidence that viruses existed in, in some of these septic systems, I guess. Is there any evidence that the, any of the COVID viruses exist there? Ms. Nash. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I believe that is what um, initiated the interest in this project is that there has been, um, there is evidence in fact in some places they are using the presence of the virus in the wastewater um, as a way to do surveillance on the extent of the disease within the population that's served by that treatment plant. So that is what indeed what sparked the, the concern here. Mr. Chair. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate uh, the conversation that we're having here, and I appreciate you allowing the conversation to move forward. I still think well, the cart is before the horse, and I think it would have been helpful in this case to have delayed the hearing on the LCCMR bill so that those people that wanted to get the information from the you would have that uh, opportunity to get that. So I appreciate uh, your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any, I don't see any other blue hands up. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to uh, testify to comment on uh, the A3 amendment? Seeing none, uh, I would renew my uh, amendment, the A3 amendment, and ask for your support. I think uh, it is a balanced amendment. It has, uh, particularly with this COVID-19 thing, I think it shows the ability of the legislature to respond to, to urgent issues, uh, in addition to the ongoing issues that uh, we have supported previously. So I would ask for your support for the amendment. The clerk will take the roll. Hudson. Hanson. Yes. Oh, why is no one talking? Claflin. Yes. Fabian. Yes, or excuse me, no, no. Fabian votes no. Backer. Um, backer, no. Becker Finn. Yes. Eklund. Yes. Fisher. Fisher, yes. Green. No. Heinzman. No. Lee. Yes. Lewick. No. Morrison. Yes. Nelson. No. Purcell. No. Oh. Sandell. Yes. Sundin. Yes. Tice. No. Wagenius. Yes. 11 eyes, seven knees. The amendment is adopted. Uh, next, we will go to the A4 amendment. Representative Eklund. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. The A4 amendment is to help a project uh, in Duluth, the Sky Harbor Airport, was previously funded in the 2019 uh, LCCMR bill, I believe. And there's some finish up work there to do. And I believe, Mr. Chair, somebody from you had somebody online that could explain the amendment. Representative Eklund moves the A4 amendment. Uh, Ms. Nowicki, uh, are you able to? Uh, testify about the amendment? Yes, I am, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, the amendment that is included, the um, Duluth Airport Authority is currently uh, working on a project to relocate the runway at the Sky Harbor Airport, which is out on Minnesota Point, out past the lift bridge in Duluth. Um, the runway is being relocated into Superior Bay for the purposes of environmental protection. Um, the office, uh, MnDOT Office of Aeronautics and, and the FAA back in 2007 approached the airport and city of Duluth um, stating that um, there was a large, the large forest area, which is part of the DNR scientific and natural area, um, penetrated um, protected surfaces off the end of the runway and would need to uh, be either removed or somehow mitigated in order for the airport to continue operation. Um, the airport authority entered into an environmental review with federal and state agencies over several years and ultimately through that collaborative process uh, agreed on the proposal to relocate the runway and shift it so it essentially points out over the water instead of out over the forest um, resource. Um, the, the runway infrastructure on the airport is actually shrinking as part of this project. There's less airport infrastructure. Um, they're shrinking to kind of be exactly the right fit for users and be out over the water to protect that environmental resource. Um, there was LCCMR funding made available to the DNR to purchase land that is owned by the Duluth Airport Authority, um, both within and adjacent to the existing SNA. This land is no longer needed for um, airport purposes once the runway is relocated. Um, the acquisition by the DNR of this land would uh, further benefit the management, preservation, and enforcement of the SNA area by expanding the Minnesota Pine Point Park Pine Point uh, SNA. Um, the DNR has completed an appraisal of the property, um, which is less than the appropriated amount um, and. The amount that was originally um, included in the request was um, established to help fund the local share that the airport authority was putting towards the project, since uh, really the main purpose of the project was for, to protect um, the environmental resource um, out on the point. So um, the amendment is to allow for um, any additional balance remaining in the already appropriated amount to be um, given a, in a grant to the airport authority to further protect uh, the Minnesota Point Pine Forest SNA uh, through the relocation of the runway. Ms. Nowicki, if you could state your name for the record and who you represent. Yes, my name is Casey Nowicki and I'm an airport planner with Short Elliott Hendrickson and I work for the Duluth Airport Authority as a consultant. Thank you. Um, well, I had Representative Fabian, but then his hand disappeared. So, Representative. Mr. You, Chair. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Your point was exactly what I was going to raise with Ms. Milwaukee to identify herself. Thank you. Representative Wagenius. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to speak against this uh, amendment. And let me clarify that when LCCMR originally uh, allocated uh, a half a million dollars for this project, it was because uh, everybody said that uh, purchasing the forest land would cost that much. And it turns out that the forest land only is about a hundred thousand dollars, not five hundred. So the four hundred left over is being requested to build uh, an airstrip. So seeing the amendment, I thought it would be just a good idea for folks who have not uh, read our constitution lately uh, 
just to hear the language and the, what the Constitution says that the money can be spent for. And it says specifically the purpose for the purpose of protection, conservation, preservation, and enhancement of the state's air, water, land, fish, wildlife, or other natural resources. Purchasing uh, a run or putting money toward a runway does not fit into those uh, categories. But we do have in the state a uh, fund at the Department of Transportation and Aeronautics Fund, which is appropriate for this money. And I understand people uh, are looking into that fund, but uh, this is a very late uh, proposal coming into us. And so people haven't had time to work through uh, Okay, I had a telephone call coming in, so I don't know where you all heard me or didn't hear, hear me, but the um, this the proposal is very late coming to us, and so the people who are advocating that they want to take this money and use it for the airstrip have not even gone through the process of talking to MnDOT and uh, talking to the aeronautics folks, which is the appropriate uh, source of funding. So I will be voting against this amendment and uh, recommending a no vote. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I question, and I don't know if the testifier is still available. Um, will this project, if it moves forward as described by the testifier, will this be the final um, project needed to take care of the issues out there uh, by Park Point in this uh, scientific natural area? I know we've been talking about this for some years now, so is, is, this, is this the final thing that needs to be done? Ms. Nowicki. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yes, this is the final uh, piece to uh, resolve the runway um, obstruction issues with the forest area. Representative Purcell. Thank you uh, uh, to the testifier and, and Mr. Chair, and, and uh, that, that's what I wanted to know. I'll be in favor of this. I'm not seeing any other uh, hands up. I wanna make sure there's an opportunity for discussion. Oh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, I heard Ms. Nowicki's testimony with regards to um, the priorities, I'll say, and I find it interesting that with all the conversations we have about water, that we're moving a runway so that the runway goes out over the lake, Lake Superior, as opposed to going over trees. I'm, I'm concerned about, I, I, just, I just find it interesting that this is the rationale for moving this runway. I'm, um, uh, um, um, I'm troubled by this. I'd like to see an accounting of the money the way it was appropriated. I think Representative Waginius said that instead of using $500,000 to acquire, I believe it was 10 acres, looking at the bill here, um, only $100,000 was used to acquire 10 acres. I'm curious to know who did the appraisal on the property when the proposal was brought to the LCCMR. Ms. Nowicki. Um, the Duluth Airport Authority did not complete an appraisal at the time that the funding was requested a few years ago. Uh, the DNR completed the most recent appraisal. The city of Duluth also did uh, complete um, their own um, that was submitted separately to the DNR. Mr. Chair. 
Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And when were those appraisals completed? Ms. Nowicki. Ms. Nowicki. Uh, Mr. Chair, the DNR's appraisal uh, and the City of Duluth appraisal, I believe, were both completed uh, at the tail end of 2019 calendar year. So, Mr. Chair. Representative Fabian. So, is it my understanding that those appraisals were not available when this appropriation was made? Um, that we're referring to here on on the A4 amendment. I just, I want to be clear on the timeline of the appraisals as to how the appraisals were brought forward relative to the approval of this uh, allocation that was made uh, before. Ms. Nowicki or Ms. Taylor. Yeah, the, I mean, yes, the appraisals, uh, Mr. Chair, were uh, brought after the, the application was made for the, the DNR or the LCCMR funding. So, Mr. Chair. Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe Ms. Nash can answer my question then. Upon what information was this appropriation recommendation made by the LCCMR, a half million dollars? Ms. Nash. Mr. Chair, members, it is um, actually fairly typical for um, especially the um, state agency projects to have a list of parcels and include in their request funding to actually conduct the appraisal. So typically with the SNA program, we are funding their program and they have multiple parcels on their list so that you know, as they do the appraisals and have their conversations with the landowners, um, you know, if there's not an agreement, they can just move down their list. For some reason, I do not know it was before my time, but this project was a specific appropriation for this project. So they're using their, their same process. The, the funding request included money to conduct the appraisal, um, but they also had an estimated value. And the budget actually shows it was 430,000. Just um, to be clear, 430,000 was set aside for the um, land cost and the rest of the um, funds in that appropriation were for the staff time um, to work with the landowner and, and do the professional services related to, a, to an acquisition. Representative Fabian. I'm done, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe, believe at the beginning of the meeting, uh, you said uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner Meyer was on the phone. I was just wondering if the DNR could weigh in on this. Commissioner Meyer. Mr. Chairman, members, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources. I think uh, Ms. Nowicki and Ms. Nash did a, a, an accurate job of reflecting the situation at hand. This is a specific project that was brought forward um, by the city of Duluth that we supported. Um, as the, the testimony has shown, the, the parcel was estimated to come in uh, somewhere between $400,000 and $500,000, I think. The appraisal came in at less than that. I know that those dollars based upon the sale, uh, that value was is a part of the project that the Duluth Airport was looking to um, complete in exchange of that air that airstrip. And uh, I believe that these funds uh, in the amendment would allow them to complete that work. Representative Eklund. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted the DNR to weigh in. I, I hope people will vote for this amendment. Thank you. Ms. Taylor, the amendment does not uh, expend additional dollars. It's not a new appropriation. It's uh, reallocating an existing appropriation. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, that's correct. Ms. Nowicki, what would happen if this uh, amendment is not adopted? 
Um, if this amendment is not adopted, um, I guess I can't speak for the Duluth Airport Authority if they would continue to move forward with the land sale or not. Um, they would continue to be able to move forward with the runway relocation project. However, it would um, negatively impact their financial situation, especially with the significant drop in revenues that they are getting um, as a result of the COVID-19 situation. Um, the airport owner um, owns both the Duluth International Airport and the Sky Harbor Airport um, and are, is being you know, very significantly impacted by the, the loss of air traffic and passenger traffic and revenues at both airports. Um, so it would further um, bring additional uh, financial constraints to them as an organization and limit their ability to continue um, investing in their infrastructure. And if they, they were not able to move forward with the sale of the land, um, if they chose to not move forward, um, the DNR would not be able to add that additional land uh, to the SNA, which potentially could limit additional management and protection and enforcement of that, that larger land area. Representative Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, to Ms. Nowicki. This may be, uh, Mr. Chair, this may be a little bit outside of our uh, committee, but just wanted to know what are some of the discussions that have been have if there are any with the Department of Transportation and the aeronautics program that represent what Dini has mentioned. Ms. Nowicki. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, yes, uh, the Duluth Airport Authority has been working with MnDOT Office of Aeronautics and they are participating in several of the phases of construction. Um, typically, MnDOT Office of Aeronautics uh, participates up to 5% of project costs. Um, they haven't, as their funding percentages have changed over time, they're, they're, the amount that they have contributed has varied from phase to phase, but typically up to 5% is what MnDOT Office of Aeronautics has contributed um, it, to various phases, basically zero to 5%, depending on the year. Representative Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What is the, uh, how does the runway changing uh, affect the environment? How, how is this uh, constitutional? Um, the runway relocation was evaluated in a federal environmental assessment and state environmental assessment worksheet uh, several years ago. Um, while it does have impacts to aquatic resources, all of the reviewing agencies and stakeholders agreed through that process that the uh, land side resources or terrestrial resources were actually um, of higher value than the aquatic resources. So um, all of the participating agencies and uh, public stakeholders that were part of the process um, ultimately at the end of, of the environmental review did support moving the runway into uh, Lake Superior Bay um, in order to protect that, that area of forest and sand dune habitat that the DNR has identified as an area of outstanding biodiversity significance. Um, there is some obviously mitigation that's occurring as part of the project. Um, there's terrestrial mitigation as well as in-water mitigation that's taking place. Uh, currently the area where the runway will be placed in the bay is of pretty is of lower um, aquatic value. Um, so there are some additional aquatic uh, mitigation activities that are happening, such as the construction of several fish cribs um, in the area surrounding the runway um, and the mitigation uh, proposal and package that was approved um, was all done through um, a, a very collaborative process with the DNR as well as the Army Corps of Engineers. Commissioner Meyer, what, um, what is the DNR's view on the environmental uh, component related to moving the runway? Mr. Chairman, members, protection of the SNA is, is of utmost importance to us. So relocating that airport and removing that threat was uh, the biggest benefit of this project in our eyes. Taylor, on the uh, amendment, um, there have been questions about constitutionality, and you've heard testimony here. Uh, would you uh, venture an opinion? 
Um, Mr. Chair and members, I, I mean, I wouldn't have a conclusion, yes or no, but I think there's been a reasonable argument made that um, it would protect the SNA, but you could probably make a counter argument as well. So, uh, you know, sort of one of the one of those situations that's a little little gray, but I I think they've made a reasonable argument. Is there any other discussion? Is there any other discussion? Oh, Representative Fabian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yep. You can hear me, right? Okay. So, um, so, Ms. Nowicki, I have. Just to point out, Representative Hansen, Chair Hansen said that what happens if this amendment isn't adopted today? We are a long ways away. And the answer that you gave, I appreciate that you're here testifying, but the answer that you gave um, is important to this amendment, but it doesn't necessarily speak to the process because we're a long ways from getting this bill to the governor's desk for a signature. That being said, um, tell me what have your conversations with the Senate been like with regards to uh, this change in the appropriation for the Duluth Airport. Ms. Nowicki. Uh, Mr. Chair, I apologize, but I am not um, up to speed on what those conversations have been um, so far. Representative Fabian. Okay, um, I'm sure we'll find out more uh, as this process goes forward, but uh, thank you. Representative Sandell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have uh, some concerns as well about the constitutionality that Representative Wardenius uh, mentioned. And I'm also surprised by the, um, um, the estimate um, of the purchase of the land, a $400,000 estimate and a uh, $100,000 purchase price. I can't really understand the, uh, the, the plus or minus 300% uh, 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 on the estimate. And I, I also uh, am interested in the question that um, Representative Fabian asked, are, are, what, is it, what is going to happen if we don't pass this amendment? And um, uh, uh, how will the um, um, environmental concerns be, um, um, be protected um, or, or assured? And I guess neither, none of those questions really have been, been answered. And so I, uh, I, um, I have a hard time on this vote. I, I, I don't have much more to say. It just is a difficult vote for me to make. Thank you. Ms. Nowicki. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I'm not sure I have anything further to, to answer without um, additional information. You know, the, the airport authority has not made a formal determination if they would move forward with the sale um, at the appraised value offered by the DNR. Members, I don't see any other uh, hands up. I know there are a number of differences on opinions on this bill. Um, I think you're gonna see uh, people voting their district. Um, so Clay, would you take the roll? Hanson. Hanson. Aye. Clacklin. No. Fabian. L. Backer. Backer, yes. Becker Finn. No. Eckland. Yes. Fisher. No. Green. No. Heinzman. Yes. Lee. No. Lewick. Yes. Morrison. No. Nelson. Yes. Purcell. Aye. Sandell. 
No. Sundin. Yes. Tice. Yes. Boginius. No. <laughs> nine eyes, nine nays. The amendment is not adopted. I renew my motion for the uh, bill, House File 44. Uh, 4408 as amended, be passed and moved to the Ways and Means Committee. Any discussion? The clerk will take the roll. Hanson. Yes. Claflin. Yes. Fabian. No. Backer. No. Becker Finn. Yes. Eckland. Yes. Fisher. Yes. Green. No. Heinzman. No. No. Lee. Yes. Lewick. No. Morrison. Yes. Nelson. No. Purcell. Aye. Sandell. Yes. Sundin. Yes. Tice. No. Wagenius. Yes. Eleven eyes, seven nays. You're muted, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I uh, did not have my glasses on when I said 4408. It's 4498. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Strohmeyer? Yes, Mr. Chair. It's House File 4498 as amended. 44, uh, 4498. 4498 is approved as amended. Is there any dis other discussion? Uh, I believe our next meeting will be on Friday. Uh, Mr. Strohmeyer, has there been any change on schedule for that? Not currently, no, Mr. Chair. Oh, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before we go, I just wanted to see if uh, you may have heard an unfortunate rumor or maybe fortunate, depending how you look at the bill. Um, what is your understanding of uh, the path for this bill going forward? I'm hearing that the Senate is is looking at this very different, differently. Have you heard that? Representative Heinzman and members, a few minutes before the meeting that, uh, convened, I received a letter from uh, Senator Ingerbretson saying there would be no LCCMR bill this year. Uh, we will make we will post that on the committee site or get that out to everyone. Um, I think it's uh, a little early to be uh, throwing in the chips uh, in terms of this. I think it's uh, frankly an abdication of responsibility uh, in terms of saying that we would not move forward <laughs> content, uh, at least as the chief author, is I would like to move this forward. Uh, get it to Ways and Means, get it to the House floor, and continue as the legislative session continues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I didn't put my hand up again, but uh, you can you can interrupt me if you like. Uh, I just want to um, address, I guess, at this point, the elephant in the room. I know that there are some serious concerns that a number of people have with the process this year. Uh, I echo a lot of those concerns. I mentioned it at the beginning of my 
comments about my amendment and, and some of the challenges that we have faced trying to get a official recommendation from the commission. And um, if, if we wind up seeing the money stay on the bottom line, which would be unfortunate due to those, I would argue were examples of, of some political gamesmanship. I do hope that in the next uh, round that the commission will uh, find a way to uh, put uh, their votes on the line after a majority of, of folks have spoken on these issues and, and get an official recommendation to the legislature. And if there are changes made in future bills, I hope that there is some more understanding is that the legislature does weigh in on the LCCMR and there may be at times uh, recommendations that fall into uh, question and it's up to the legislature to try and navigate those waters as best they can and find solutions that allow a bill to go forward. Thank you for uh, the indulgence as uh, Chair Fabian or Representative Fabian would say. Thank you, Chair Hansen. Thank you, members. I think it's important um, that the process and the procedures for the LCCMR were set out in law. And it was debated and discussed on the importance to have uh, a supermajority shows so there, and this same procedure was followed with outdoor heritage to show that there is a strong support for the recommendations. This uh, was not the first time that there was not a formal recommendation made. There have been previous years where the 12 votes were not. The uh, appropriations uh, in the author's amendment, several of those were using funds that were um, no longer mm -hmm going to be used because of a cancellation of a project, a project that was included last year. So you will see the FY20 and the FY21 when we discuss that in terms of where those appropriations are. I think that this is a good bill. I think that it responds um, to the emerging crisis or the current crisis relating to COVID. Mm -hmm. And we're able as the legislature to respond quickly to those needs and other needs that are there. There are other mechanisms for dealing with wastewater treatment grants. And I think there will be proposals coming as the bonding bill is discussed and more federal stimulus comes as well. With that, I would adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm.